Please take your Bible and turn to Genesis chapter 1. Today we're going to begin in verse 6, but before we get started, I would like to suggest that we recognize and remember three aspects of our God, Yahweh, that are revealed by His creation. First, Yahweh is creative and He is sustaining. Not only did he create the entire universe by the power of his spoken word, he created it to run itself and sustain itself by the natural laws of physics that he established. Second, Yahweh is transcendent. Now what does this word transcendent mean? Transcendent can be defined as beyond or above the normal or merely physical human experience. And as a description of Yahweh, it means that he exists apart from the universe that he created. And he's not subject to its limitations. Yahweh is above his creation. He isn't part of it. He exists completely outside our scope of normal human physical experience. And that's why we don't see him or experience him in the same way we do everything else. And third, Yahweh is self-sufficient. He is not in need of anything in his creation. And his involvement with it is completely voluntary. There's an old story about an old Jewish poet named Yehuda Halevi who lived back around 1100 A.D. in Spain. And this old Jewish poet's neighbor was also a poet, but his neighbor was a, a Gentile. And on top of that, he was an atheist. Well, they had frequent discussions about the origin of the universe, and the atheist always said that it just came into being on its own. One day, the atheist poet couldn't come up with an ending for a, a beautiful poem that he was working on. His inspiration had left him, and so because he couldn't find the right words to fit the rhyme and the meter, he decided to go for a walk and clear his mind. And while he was out, his Jewish neighbor passed by his house, and he couldn't help seeing the sheet of paper lying on his desk right by an open window. And he was curious, and he leaned over through the window and read the unfinished poem and added the perfect ending for it. Well, the atheist came home, and he could hardly believe his eyes. Who had written these perfect, beautiful lines? He was full of wonder and a little bit suspicious as he went next door to tell Yehuda what happened. And Yehuda said, well, why are you surprised? The poem must have written itself. And the atheist said, you know that's impossible. Don't joke with me. A work of art like that doesn't come into being by itself. And Yehuda said, aha! You admit that a poem doesn't write itself, but neither does such a magnificent world as the one we live in with all of the complex, intricate workings create itself. And the atheist finally admitted defeat, that the world must have been created by some intelligent, exalted being. Well, let's look at Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 6, the Bible says, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Just as God divided the light and the darkness in verse 4, here in verse 6, he divides or separates the waters. As we saw in our last session, our God is a God of distinctions and separations. And we will see more of this in the creation story with, with his dividing the dry land from the sea and the separations of the plants and the separations of the animals. Now, regarding this dividing of the waters, We'll see in the very next verse that the waters above were divided from the waters below. 
And this dividing was done by a firmament. Now what is a firmament? The word firmament or expanse in some Bibles is the English translation of the Hebrew word rakia. This word is also used to describe a piece of metal that has been hammered flat. And in scripture it is used in the sense of spreading out or stretching out. In Genesis chapter 1, the firmament up above is spread out to separate the waters above, on, above the earth, from the waters below, the waters that are both on and under the earth. Now, many people think that the firmament is just the sky and the atmosphere above the earth. Is that correct? Or is there more to it than that? What is this firmament? What does it consist of? It's always been somewhat of a mysterious puzzle and it has been greatly debated. The Greek and English translations of the Hebrew word rachia can seem to suggest a firm, hard, solid firmament like a dome as some of the ancient cultures believed. But the original Hebrew word rakia doesn't have to mean that. It means an open expanse but not necessarily a solid structure. The firmament in Genesis 1 surrounds earth as the atmosphere and as part of what we call outer space. It is equated with heaven and the heavens, plural, several times in scripture. Now, what, which heavens are we talking about here? The Hebrew word for heaven or heavens in Genesis 1 is Shemaim, Strong's number 8064, which is actually a plural word. And it can mean, first of all, the sky and the atmosphere. Secondly, what we call outer space, where the sun, the moon, and the stars are. And thirdly, the word can mean the place where God dwells, what some people call the third heaven. Now there are various Babylonian and Hindu and Islamic and Jewish traditions about how many levels of heaven there are. And while our Bible doesn't specifically say exactly how many levels of heaven there are, it only speaks of these three. What we call the sky or the atmosphere, outer space where the sun, moon, and stars are, and the dwelling place of God and the angels. In Genesis 1 seems to speak of both the sky or atmosphere and at least to some extent what we call outer space when it says heaven or heavens. Contrary to what some think, it's not just the blue sky above where the earth's atmosphere is. Now some say that all rain comes from the waters above, but I don't think that's correct. And why do I say that? Well, let's skip ahead to verses 14 and 15 where the creation of the sun, moon, and stars takes place on day four, and we'll see where they are. Beginning in verse 14, the Bible says, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years and let them be f um, for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and it was so and then verse 17 is a third witness of their location removing all doubt it says and God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth so the sun moon and stars were placed by God in the firmament, not above it. The place where they are, at least part of what we call outer space, is also part of the firmament according to scripture. Isn't that right? I mean, if that's where the sun, moon, and stars are, that's what we think of as outer space, at least part of it. But that's part of the firmament. That's where he placed them. 
And so the waters above are separated from the waters below by this firmament. And so where are the waters above? They must be above the firmament. Because it separates the waters above from the waters below. So the waters above seem to be waters that are placed by God above the visible heavens. Even above outer space. Maybe that's what the sea of glass before his throne is in Revelation chapter 4. Psalm 148 verse 4 also speaks of waters that are above the heavens. So the rains actually come from the waters below that are in the oceans and seas and lakes and rivers and springs that go through cycles of evaporation into the clouds and condensation that falls as precipitation. Now this can be confusing and I certainly cannot answer every conceivable question about the firmament but maybe this picture will help. From what the Bible says the firmament consists of two of the, th the three heavens which are above the earth. The atmosphere and outer space. The firmament would be both of those. With waters both above and below. It seems to include the first heaven, which is our sky and atmosphere, and outer space where the sun, moon, and stars are. And these two heavens are under the waters which are above and under the third heaven where Yahweh's throne is. All right, let's go on and read verses 7 and 8. The Bible says, And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. Now there's one other idea that may or not be correct, but I'll share it with you anyway. Some think that the waters above originally formed an invisible water canopy over the earth, trapping the earth's heat and providing a protective greenhouse effect and a, um, a tropical climate on the entire planet that contributed to longer lifespans until it collapsed at the time of the Great Flood. And this could be one of the sources of water in that flood. Genesis chapter 7 verse 11 says that the windows of heaven were opened. Could be referring to that. Well verses 7 and 8 make it clear that God's intention that he stated in verse 6 did indeed become a reality. He said let there be a firmament divide the, to divide the waters above from the waters below and it happened. Again the miraculous creative power of his spoken word caused his design to come into existence supernaturally. And verse 8 says that God made the firmament or expanse consisting of these two heavens on day two. It consists of these two heavens. That's a little easier to see in the Hebraic Roots Bible which correctly translates that Hebrew word shamaim as a plural word. Where in verse 8 it says, Elohim call the expanse heavens. So in his creation of the firmament, Yahweh took the raw, unformed, empty creation of day one. And continued to transform it and establish the elements of nature. He was in control of the forces of nature on our world. And he still is. I have shown another teaching how he sometimes manipulates nature to bring about judgment on nations who do harm to his people Israel. And as the governments of this world continue to go down this course of trying to divide the land of Israel, if they succeed by the United Nations imposing a two-state solution on Israel that divides the land of Israel and the city of Jerusalem as scripture prophesies will happen in the last days I believe that we will see Yahweh use the forces of nature 
again, such as earthquakes, to execute his judgment on the nations, including the United States of America, if our president doesn't veto that UN resolution when it's brought up. Some think that all of these things could happen before he leaves office on January 20th. We need to pay attention and we need to pray.